scare, you know, uh, if, in line with our, our Halloween theme, there's no viewer, and <laughs> somehow you don't see your own face in the mirror here. But that aside, uh, there's a reflective sphere on the left and, and a refractive one on the right. And there are many things wrong with this, this image. Do you guys see that? Like, for one, these are hard shadows, but you have an area light. Um, but more importantly, um, what's, what's true about crystal, crystal balls? In general, they tend to focus light. Right? In other words, I have this light bulb here. The light rays come into this, and then due to refraction, they come in like that. And then we get this little artifact right in the, the, the center of your shadow, which is actually a bright spot. <coughs> and what is that thing called? Starts with a C. Starts with caustic. Yep, caustic. Thank you. Uh, uh, right. So in reality, the scene should look closer to this, right? And, and we've already talked in this course about how to maybe cope with uh, the, the soft shadow here. Any ideas? By the way, how are you going to make a soft shadow? Global illumination. False. How do you make a soft shadow under ray tracing? More rays. Thank you. In particular, um, this, this ray is a big area uh, on, 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 the, on the, the ceiling. If you remember a few lectures back, um, one thing you could do would be generate a bunch of rays to different points in the light. Good shot. Uh, right, but today we're going to try to capture that, that cost from the bottom. And you guys see why it's tricky to, to, to render that? We, we've talked about this before. But essentially, the ray tracing algorithm is going to draw a ray from your eye to the plane. Right? But then, in order to see if you're inside of a caustic or not, what would you have to do? You have to figure out if there's some path of rays through this object that gets back to the light bulb. But that's like a weird root finding problem. Do you see that? Because like, it's not just a straight line anymore. It's like bouncing through this and refracting. Uh, and, and that's a system of equations that, that generally is not really solved. OK. Whereas another clue that we've done something wrong, I mean, so far we've basically talked about BRDFs dealing with only point lights and, and like isolated ones, which are great for making dramatic scenes with spotlights, but also great for like everyday kind of warmly lit uh, rooms, right? And, and in particular, BRDF doesn't care about how the light gets to the surface, right? It just care, it just tells you how much light comes up. It doesn't care about light that comes from a light bulb versus light that comes from a fluorescent light versus light that bounces up the light. Uh, he's a radiant guy. Uh, and, and, and so uh, the reality is that we need to account for all of these if we really want to ray trace properly. Let's pause for a moment and, and, and think. Um, do we think that global illumination algorithms are fast? No, <laughs> yeah, they are hella slow, would be the, uh, the, the term for complexity here. Uh, the, the, uh, right, because essentially, like, in addition to the complexity of your ray tracer now, um, you're coping with a whole new set of challenges, which is like integrals over the sphere at every point of your surface. Okay? Uh, if you want to formalize this in, in scary looking notation, here it is. Uh, uh, but I, I, So if, if we just think of an integral like a sum, I don't think this is actually so bad to think about. Um, so here, the idea is that L <coughs> is the vector out of, of the sort of half sphere that's sitting on a point on your surface. Right? And so L in of, of this vector L is telling me how much light comes in in that direction. Right? So, so far, when we've had point lights, this thing is essentially a delta function. Right? It's just like all the light is coming from this one place. But it could be that it's coming from a whole distribution over the sphere. Right? In which case, if I want to know L out, what do I have to do? I have to take the integral of L in from all possible directions L discounted by the pure Yeah, And that's really the uh, global illumination uh, problem. In particular, uh, the question that we should ask is, where does LN come from? And, and this is where, where uh, stuff is going to hit the fan. Right? Because where does LN come from? Well, my LN is someone else's LF. Does that make sense? So do I expect any ray tracing system, no matter how complicated, to be able to just get away, like if I send out enough rays, to be able to capture this exactly? This is actually a system of equations. It doesn't look at this this way, but here's the way to think about it. Let's say I have two different points on a surface here, right? His LN has to do with this guy's L out. His L out has to do with this guy's LN. Yeah? So I can't compute one without the other. You see how crazy this is? So if I really, really wanted to solve the rendering problem, what would I have to do? I would have to have the distribution of L out over every sphere at every point on my surface and solve an integral equation over the whole thing. Now the reality is we don't do that because rendering is hard already. <laughs> um, so instead, you know, how have, we, how have we coped with that in the past? We've done stuff like limit the number of bounces and so on. 
these are just heuristics that say like, how much does my surface get lit if light is bouncing back and forth between my finger and my thumb like a million times? Very little, right? Like, it, 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 it mostly just gets absorbed by the surface every time. And we're really leveraging that um, to, to, to do things correctly. Yeah. Um, incidentally, typically we add an additional term here for just like a light source. But these are, this just counts for like the interreflection and then you maybe have some external source of energy. Does this make sense to everybody? Just like what this equation is telling you? I think it's pretty straightforward. It's just saying that the, the amount of stuff that comes out of a point is a function of what comes in. But the thing to notice is that so far we've just been like kind of computing that directly, but in reality this is a system of equations because what comes out of me depends on what comes out of you and vice versa. Yeah? Um, and it's not a fun system of equations with that. Well, it's extremely fun, but, but, but not, not something we can solve. Okay? Um, so this dates back to the 1980s. Uh, uh, this is called the rendering equation for obvious reasons, <laughs> uh, or sometimes uh, you know illumination equation or something. Uh, and and, and uh, it's one of these things that people in graphics always talk about as if we're solving what the reality is that we we don't do because it's too complicated. Okay. Um, right. So the, the basic takeaway so far is that analytically solving the rendering equation to really account for every possible bounce of light off of everything and into everything else is, 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 is really usually impossible to just read off the solution. Um, and so instead, we're going to use lots of randomized techniques to try and kind of simulate solving it-ish. <laughs> okay? Um, there are actually finite element methods out there that try to explicitly write down that system of equations and solve it. Um, these are mostly of theoretical interest, but occasionally people have managed to get them to work in practice. Uh, these fall in a category of algorithms called radiosity, which I encourage you to read about and not do for your final project. Okay, um, these are hard things to get rid of. Okay, so uh, our question is how do we do it in practice, right? If I want this dramatic scene of, of Roman columns and broken whatever, and, and there's light bouncing every which way around in this room, um, you know, I prefer not to set up an infinity by infinity matrix and, and solve. Uh, so, so what are my what are my options? Here? Um, and, and there are many. So, what have we done so far in, in, in homework four? Right, we, we've essentially implemented this machinery for taking your ray and figuring out the first thing that the ray runs into. But there's no reason why that ray has to come out of your eye. Right, we've already seen that a few times, like shadow rays. Uh, and we can continue to leverage that machinery uh, even more to do some versions of, of global illumination. Uh, and, and so we're going to actually sketch out a few different ones that are not so hard to implement in the ray trace you already have. In fact, for fun, if you're bored this afternoon, you can try and add some of these. They're really not going to work to. But you'll see that they work really poorly. Uh, and then we'll talk about what, what happens in practice. Okay? So the simplest thing to do, uh, the sort of Monte Carlo, you know, coin flip your way out of this uh, 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 problem, would be to say, okay, well, what did I do in my ray trace? I, 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 run my right into a surface, and then when I want to figure out how it gets lit, I draw a ray directly to the light bulb, right? and then I, I, I use the color of the light bulb to, to determine the illumination here. Okay? But I could also just start, like I could say, okay, I hit into the surface, now I'm going to randomly generate a thousand rays out of this point that go in random directions anywhere. Right? And then I'm going to read, like, so maybe it hits into the ceiling, I read the light that it gets reflected off of the ceiling, and I account for that in my, my, my rendering at this point. Here's the thing. How many rays do you think you need to do that spherical integral well? A lot, like on the orders of hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Okay, um, and that's multiplied by the number of pixels in your image, and that's only a single bounce. Yeah? Uh, so in reality, if I wanted to do global illumination, right? so I, I have the secondary thing, I want to know how much light comes off of the ceiling, well, how do I do that? Well, now that point needs to generate a million rays that go out of it, right? And do you see the problem here? Um, and, and, and so, typically in, in Monte Carlo ray creating tracing, you know, it's, it's, it's extremely recursive algorithm for one. Um, but there, there's some tricks that we do to try and improve so that you know, as we go from the primary ray to the secondary, tertiary, and so on, um, at some point you got to stop, or else your algorithm is going to go for it. So there are a couple uh, pretty straightforward things that we do to fix that. Uh, one is that explicitly in every uh, step of this, you, you trace a ray to the light bulb, right? So you kind of do the illumination you already did before, and then you just view this as kind of gravy on top, like some additional rays that you're going to send out. But um, 
if you do this, right, and that, that's not so complicated to do. Like, for instance, a pretty, a pretty standard thing to do would be to run array into the wall and then just have secondary bounces which are lit, like with lit version shading and, and very simple normal bounces, right? And at least you get some amount of light reflected on uh, secondarily. And the kind of image that you'll get, uh, uh, I'll show you here, uh, looks like this. Now, if I were running an animation studio, could I, could I put that in my, my film? <coughs> Probably not, right? Like, so there's like grain on top of this. Do you guys see that? And do you see why it's so random? I mean, essentially, at, at every point on your surface, you're just scattering a bunch of rays out and, and averaging their color and using that for your BRDF calculation. But like two adjacent pixels here get two different random sets of rays that get scattered away. Um, and, and so that, that, that actually increases the, the noise and the impact. On the other hand, you do, if you look really closely at this edge here, you'll see that there's like a slight blue tinge on the floor. So you did get something, yeah. Um, right. So uh, yeah. So there, there are a lot of different ways around uh, this trick, um, and, and let's outline a few. Um, right. One of them uh, is, is to essentially use the anti-aliasing algorithms that we already have. So to send a bunch of rays through the primary uh, pixel and keep doing these secondary bounces, because essentially the more times you do this, the more this random noise will kind of cancel out. Notice I'm talking about these in a high level. We have no equations here because it's very hard to prove which of these systems is better than which other one. Um, typically, like if, you, if you boot up Maya or like whatever your favorite tool is for rendering and, and modeling, you'll see that these are just all checkboxes you can turn on and off. Uh, right, so, so do you guys get the idea here? So here I have a very noisy color that I get for every single pixel, but I can send a bunch of rays into the pixel and add average the result. Yeah. This tends not to be very effective. Uh, right, uh, and of course, again, you should always, uh, you know, trace the shadow wave and so on. Um, right. So a different thing that you can do, uh, let's see here, is is connect every uh, surface point on the way to light by a shadow ray, uh, and uh, do all. So essentially, you can also um, trace. You can trace rays backward, and you can trace rays forward to the light, and that's going to be your target. So anyway, if you add more and more paths to a pixel, you can see that the noise begins <coughs> to, to decrease a little bit. Uh, and eventually, for this kind of inversion looking scene, it, it begins to be okay. However, what do you think is going to happen when I put back that scene that we had before with the mirror and the, uh, the cussing? So now think about what happens. Like, I, 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 I go to this point here on the ball, and now this point is going to start scattering Rays around, but this is a completely reflective object, right? So like maybe this, you know, one pixel for whatever reason, just by random chance, gets like ten things here and five things there. So this guy's gonna look completely red because that's just all you see because it's a mirror, right? And maybe its neighbor's gonna look completely blue. So essentially, when you have uh, these shiny surfaces, um, what you get is noise, but a very particular species of noise because every once in a while, what do you think these white cor pixels, pixels correspond to? They sort of correspond to like I had bad luck and it bounced right into the light source, right? And that just has to do with your, your random yeah? But of course, if, if you you know as 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 before, our solution is is add more rays and eventually the noise decreases. Yeah. So the cost of this is that because there's just a high chance that you're going to get you bounce off right below the back. Yeah, exactly. So the cost of here, the idea is that when I ray trace this point. Now I'm going to randomly generate a bunch of, of directions from the floor and go through the sphere. And since this is a pretty big light bulb, you have a pretty good chance of, of, of running into it. Yeah, it's a great question. On the other hand, you also have not a bad chance of hitting the light bulb, but bouncing off of the sphere and then hitting the light, and that's like the, the, the other step that you see. Yeah. And the reason that you, these are so speculate is because you're only averaging 10 bats. Right? So if one of those 10 hits the light bulb, so all of a sudden that's one tenth of your color. Even it's not one tenth of the seat, you just have that button. Yeah. Okay. Right. So if you increase the number of paths, eventually this looks good, but of course this is ridiculously slow right now. Right? Because now think about what's going on. For every secondary ray that comes out of the wall, well, if it hits into the sphere, I need additional <coughs> rays that go through the sphere until it hits the floor, just to color that, that secondary ray. It's very complicated. Um, as a note, uh, if you add an explicit light sampling, your noise decreases a little bit, but you can 
can see that uh, it's still not so great. Yeah. By the way, one hack that we learned about in Perlin noise was to randomly generate a list of random numbers ahead of time and then just keep reusing that list. Do you think that's a good idea here? No, right? Because images have a lot of pixels, right? So if you're reusing that list of random numbers in any sort of coherent way, I guess what your image is going to look like. It's actually, I have an example. It's really cool. <laughs> there it is. Um, so essentially, what you're seeing right here is the patterns in your random number generator uh, 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 being used to, gen to generate pixels. Okay. Um, so you have to be really careful in these kinds of algorithms to have totally uniform random numbers that are, have no correlation with one another, which of course is a hard thing to do with a computer. Um, if you incidentally want to play with this stuff, which I thought was cool, ah, demo. Um, let me actually open it up. It's really fun to play with. This guy, madebyevan.com, I'm a, I'm a big fan of uh, Evan and the things that he makes. Uh, right, so, so let's uh, open this up. And you can't see anything on my screen, so that's not good. Uh, yeah, can you see now? So Evan um, <coughs> is, a, is an OpenGL miracle worker and has managed to implement path tracing in his GPU, uh, which is just incredible. And in case that wasn't hard enough, you managed to do it in WebGL. But it actually runs in your browser. So you can see here um, that I rotate my scene. And then it's and what it's doing in real time is just sending more and more rays. So you can see the noise just kind of decreases. Um, I think if we change our material to mirror, um, you can see that the noise is a lot worse when you start. Um, and that what you end up with, oh, oh look at that, you can drag the screen too. Um, is that essentially this is one of these algorithms where the longer that you run it, the, the better it gets. Um, but it's extremely hard to choose that parameter at, at, at time zero. Uh, and so this is like one of these annoying sources of uh, things that people have to play with quite a bit to get right in their, their pipeline. Right. Ah, good. Okay. Anyway, so you guys have a link in the slides. I'll create it in private. It's a good way to get some intuition. About what's, uh, what's going on. Okay. So there's all kinds of renderers out there if you want to play with this at home. There's Mitsuba, QBRT, Lux, and so on. Yeah. Incidentally, this is one of the very first path traced uh, images from the 1980s by Kajia. Now that's kind of a funny story. Um, and it's reflective of what I saw in my office hours this morning. So, so Kajia coded this thing up. Everybody's very excited. It's, I think, the cover of an academic journal and, and so on. This is a big accomplishment in the computer graphics world. Um, the only issue is this code was extremely buggy. Uh, and, and so uh, later on, somebody like in a funny <coughs> project was trying to reproduce these images, and he managed to, but only by adding like having bugs in his ray tracing code. Uh, and so there's actually a little bit of an academic issue. Um, only a tiny one. I mean, at the end of the day, the path tracer is still more or less right. Uh, and, but so it's kind of if you guys think that it's it's weird that your your ray tracers have these bugs and you get these cool looking images, but they're not the images that we told you you should get. Like that that is. You know, part and parcel of the history of, of ray tracing all the way back to the original path trace image. Uh, but anyway, the, uh, any questions about the, the algorithm so far? I think in, in, in practice, it's pretty simple to implement. Right? You just you hit the ray into the first thing you see, and then instead of just doing a ray toward the light, you just scatter rays every which way and, and every which way. That's really all that's going on. But when you have reflective objects in your scene, that, that can get you in trouble. Yeah. yeah. So the algorithm that you showed, but that takes a really long. It does. Rule time global illumination is not really a thing. Uh, right? I mean, you saw that WebGL is about as busy as you can get. Uh, no, there's a lot of tricks to make uh, uh, global illumination happen in real time, but they're not going to be nearly this, this level of quality. Um, so, uh, uh, for instance, let's see here. What are things people do? The most hacky version of real time global illumination is a trick called the ambient occlusion, where what you do is, like, when you're close to a sharp edge, you just kind of take the lighting and include a little bit of the lighting on the other side of the edge. The idea being that probably near sharp edges is where global illumination matters. Um, it's a good way to get a research paper rejected, by the way. It's sort of talk about any um, But uh, yeah, no, real time uh, uh, global illumination is largely no problem. And what the future to do this So, like games? And games do all kinds of crazy stuff. So, we're going to maybe defer that conversation a little bit until we talk about rasterization. But the amount of work that would go into doing global illumination in a video game is extremely difficult.
because all of this machinery is depending on having this ray tracing set up, right? So think about like a video game. What it wants to do is go down the list of triangles that you have and you've seen one by one and draw them, and that does not deal well with like having things bounce light off of each other. Cool. Oh, sorry. Any other questions? Sorry, I gave kind of a non-answer. I think I think we'll have, we'll have some more answer when we're, we're closer to, to the answer. people do in, in, in this ray tracing stuff is what you call screen space uh, processing, where you render your scene and then you basically do image processing as if it were a photograph. <laughs> and there's some, some clever image filters that can kind of simulate global illumination where you join them and just kind of look at stuff nearby. Um, these are totally made up. Things that just kind of look nice. Yeah. But um, in general, ray tracing on the GPU is, is I think one of these challenge problems. That communicated to you guys is path tracing is really costly, <laughs> right? Because now for every pixel you need to generate hundreds of rays coming out of that guy to get just like that little additional soft shadow. Notice that like this is a lot of extra CPU time for a really simple um, effect. Yeah? Um, but it can make some, 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 some really some really beautiful images. So here uh, Henrik I think has just run path tracing until the cows come home. And finally uh, we have a nice uh, elevated image and if you look very closely at this blue wall it has a very lovely highlight. These are very subtle effects. Okay. Uh, so one thing you can do uh, that, that inspires a lot of the algorithms we'll talk about next is let's say that I take this image and then I render it again without global illumination and I subtract the two. Okay, so in other words, I'm just curious, like, what is the effect of global illumination of my rendering algorithm? Uh, what I'll get is some image that looks like this. Notice the color is gone now, right? Because that, that, that was present in both. Right? And what's left is kind of a, like the caustic and some of the reflections and so on. Yeah. Um, so one of the big observations that people made early on in the global illumination world is that if you look at this image, right, this is the difference between like with and without global illumination, this is a smooth image. And that makes sense, right? I mean, like if you, if you think about the light that's bounced off the floor into the wall, that's like a very diffuse kind of, of thing, right? But the path trace path tracing algorithm that we talked about is like the opposite of smooth, right? It's sending these kind of sharp rays out and, and averaging our color and not considering stuff in between. So the next algorithm we'll talk about is going to leverage the smooth structure to do it in kind of a reverse fashion. And this idea is called a radiance caching. This would be harder to do as an extra credit on your assignment. I would save this for a project. So the basic idea is that indirect illumination is smooth. So in other words, if I compute the indirect illumination of this pixel, and I compute it at like some pixel right next to it, I don't expect those to be all that Different, right? So in a radiance caching, what I do is maybe I have a select subset of pixels where I send out that secondary ray, and then I just take the, the indirect values that I, I got at that guy and just smear it to things nearby. Right? That's this, this basic trick. Okay? And so what we do is we sample sparsely along the image, and then we interpolate uh, to get nearby uh, indirect illumination. That makes sense? Where do you think this algorithm is going to fail? Sharp edges, right? Like think about that Cornell box with the blue and the red, right? Right where they meet, there's a sharp edge, so it really shouldn't be blurring stuff across them. Yeah. Um, so, so the basic idea in a radiance caching is just to say, okay, I'm gonna send more pixels through that sphere. I'm gonna get a better integral for that secondary illumination, but I'm gonna do it at fewer places, and then just kind of share the result among a bunch of pixels. Um, so here's a pretty common one. So in a radiance caching, up, by the way, these are often multi-pass rendering algorithms. Well, they'll maybe <coughs> render kind of a boring version of the scene first to get some idea of what's going on, and then go back through and do a more detailed one. So here, at the yellow pixels, our radiance caching algorithm has done the full global illumination calculation. Um, notice that this was, uh, I think the way this image was, was generated was in a multi-pass fashion. So the first thing that they did was render it just using boring, diffuse light, whatever just to be able to detect that there's some sharp edges. And then notice what they did. They placed additional yellow samples at those sharp edges um, so that you get a better uh, radiance cache there. 
and then the secondary one, um, when you write your ray tracer, you know, add a little Boolean flag in your code that says yes or no, should I do global illumination or not? Right? Uh, and then if it's yes, you do the full calculation. If not, maybe you just grab global illumination from one of the nearby yellow guys. Yes? Yes. Is the sphere sort of bumpy? It is. And in fact, if you look at the back wall, you'll see all kinds of slight artifacts. Yeah? And that's because of the other. Uh, yeah, do you guys have a good explanation for why? Yeah, since it's pulling the direct light from a nearby point, like nearby points will have some similar patterns. You got it. Yeah. It's just like when we talked about pearl and noise, right? At these points, you're doing global illumination. But remember, that's still a little noisy. Yeah? So if I take these global illumination values and I just kind of interpolate them in between, well, yeah, now it's smooth just by virtue of like not having done that procedure between the yellow points, but it's still going to kind of add little bumps up and down just at a lower frequency. Absolutely, that's a big cache. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. So the irradiance cache is the set of yellow points. So you kind of do one pass in your ray tracer where you just do the full calculation of the yellow guys, and then another pass where you kind of glue those two pieces together. Um, and the typical ways that you do that are, are very simple, right? You would just say, like, well, if I'm at this pixel, I find the closest yellow point that is, or maybe the closest to an average to yellow point somewhere. Okay, uh, this was invented um, quite a long time ago, uh, and, and is really the standard in, in like architecture and, and some of these fields where it really matters to get the lighting just right, um, because at the very least, you know that at those yellow points, you have the correct value you know, if you've spent enough time. Okay. And you can get really beautiful images. This thing is rendered, um, which, is, which is pretty surprising. And this is from a while back then. So are there any questions about a radiance caching? I think it's pretty, these are all pretty straightforward techniques, but they're really hard to get right. And the reason is because, like, <coughs> these are only algorithms that work if you're willing to send out a billion rays. But, like, debunking your code is just terrible, right? Because if you don't send out a billion rays, you know you're going to get noise. But it also could be that you're getting noise because your code is wrong. And, 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 and you can see I've been burnt by this little test. Okay? Excellent. So now we're going to talk about a third algorithm, um, which is, I, I would argue, kind of a, a, a modification of the irradiance caching technique. So in irradiance caching, those yellow points are kind of chosen based on screen space. Like you can see, if you look at this image closer, you see they're mostly kind of on a grid. Yeah? The other way that you could go about this um, is to uh, use ray tracing yet again in kind of creative fashion. Um, and this uh, is to use a technique called photon mapping. I think this is one of the more popular techniques for global illumination. So the idea of photon mapping is actually to simulate the physics of light the way you really should do it. Right? So, so in ray tracing, when we simulate, we're not really simulating physics, we're kind of doing the reverse of that. Right? In photon mapping, you say, no, I'm just going to scatter a bunch of rays out of a light bulb and see where they land. Because that's really what, what rendering is at the end of the day. <laughs> you guys see that? That's so in, in the photon mapping technique, um, you generate things that are photons in quotation marks. <laughs> uh, they're definitely quotation marks here. And you cast them out of the light bulb. And then, of course, depending on, on the path that they follow, like maybe they go through that, that refractive sphere, maybe they reflect, whatever, they end up in different places in your scene. That makes sense. So you get something that looks like, kind of like this, right? So you have, and this is something that happens before you begin ray tracing. Right, so you first scatter photons all over your scene, and then you begin the retracing process. Cool. So why would you do this? Well, now this gives you some rough idea. So let's say that now I render this pixel here, right? And I notice there's a photon nearby that I got from an indirect illumination. Right? Well, the one thing I can do is just include his color a little bit in my lighting, in addition to the direct uh, calculation I did before. Um, so it's actually quite similar to uh, radiance caching. Um, but one of the advantages here uh, is that we can use the data structures we've already talked about in this class to store those photons, right? So if I'm, if I'm doing a query and I render this wall and I want to know what photons are nearby, that's a relatively fast thing to do using a structure like a KD tree, which we've already talked about. Yeah. Right, so the, the, the algorithm looks something like this. You, you, you cast, um, now that you've, you've computed all of these, these photons, now I want to re actually render my scene. So I cast the ray into the scene, and I want to render this point. And now, uh, rather than, than doing, um, you know, scattering out secondary rays, I'm just going to iterate over the nearby photons and calculate their effect 
it's essentially like doing that spherical integral we talked about before, but rather than randomly generating points on the spheres, we're actually generating points as arrows to the closest photons. Cool? Um, right, and this is called the final gather stage of the photon mapping algorithm. So like, here's an example, um, and you can kind of see what's going on, right? So for instance, a lot of the photons ended up right here, which makes sense because that's, that's been kind of focused from the light bulb downward. This is different from the irradiance caching algorithm from where most of your photons just ended up on kind of sharp edges. Right? Irradiance caching, it would be kind of hard to detect that it's costing more Okay. Um, right, so are there, are there any questions about, about photon mapping? So essentially there's this big constellation of different ways to do global illumination, and they're all very similar, right? There's photon mapping, irradiance caching, path tracing. And let's think just for a minute about the difference between them. So path tracing is like <coughs> render a point, and now I'm just going to do that integral, that BRDF integral, like shooting out random rays and then chuck it into the color at every point independently. That creates a lot of noise. Right? Um, there's the radiance caching where in image space I do some secondary calculation of, 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 of light. Like I do one pass, I choose those yellow pixels, and then I do another pass. So there's photon mapping where I first trace rays not from my eye but from the light bulb, and then I use that as additional information. And once you have these kinds of things implemented, there's all kinds of cool stuff you can do. Uh, so for instance, here uh, is another application of global illumination uh, in subsurface scattering, where here maybe I, I path trace a, a, a ray into the internal workings of, of my bust here, and then it takes some weird nonlinear path before it gets photon mapped somewhere else. It's perfectly fine. Uh, and you can see the difference here, like on the right hand side, it's kind of, uh, looks closer to, like milk is another great example of a, uh, a material that has a subsurface scatter. Uh, and, and, and this turns out to matter quite a bit. So for example, here's a photograph and here's a rendering of a face. Um, if you did not include subsurface scatter, you would immediately be able to see the different tip face on the right hand side. Uh, this is an impressive one. Yeah, this might be a complete aside, but why did the eyelashes show up? Is there like a specific reason? Why do the eyelashes show up? What well, don't show up in the rendering? Well, I think they do. Uh, he has left eyelashes. Oh, <laughs> I think this might just be a, our, our bad projector. But I do think you actually, you do have a good point, which is that the eyelashes are more blurred out here than they are there. Um, can you tell me why is that, why is that likely to happen? I mean, just off of it, it kind of looks like it's running into the shadow that's right underneath the eye. You got it. These are extremely thin features, right? And so all of these randomized uh, ray tracing techniques are very likely to just mess up with Okay, so we're going to spend our last uh, uh, bit of class here uh, talking a little bit more generally. I mean, these are just the beginning, and hopefully you guys understand at this point, I think, I think we've really done it to death, that in ray tracing, there are all of these different techniques that we would call Monte Carlo techniques. Monte Carlo, you know, is a place with a lot of, uh, I don't say cinemas, but what I meant to say was casinos. Uh, uh, you know, and gambling, right? Gambling is all about random numbers. And unfortunately, ray tracers get have about as good success rate as, as gambling uh, in terms of randomly generating rays and hoping to get a useful signal, which explains why you have to why this algorithm is so slow. Yeah? Um, but this is just a, like the tip of the iceberg in terms of cool randomized techniques. So for example, there's bi-directional path tracing where maybe you send rays from the light and your eye and see if they can meet halfway or uh, certain fun element techniques and so on. Um, this would and indeed does warrant a class of its own at many institutions. Sadly for you guys, MIT's graphics group is a little small, so I think this, this is pretty good. kind of advanced render graphics, so this is kind of amazing. Um, but there, there's, there's, there's really all kinds of cool stuff that you can do, right? Um, right? And, and all of these things have to do with just taking integrals over more variables, right? Like so, so as a little bit of review, you know, if I want to deal with anti-aliasing in my pixel, what did I do? I sent more rays, I integrated over the pixel. If I wanted to include a soft light source, I sent more rays to different points in the light source. I want to have a lens. Maybe I send some rays to deal with the aberration. Right? Same thing with, with motion blur, right? Over different points in time. And so I can think of this as roughly a formula that's like the integral, the integral, the integral, the integral, the integral, the integral of, right, of some light function, d everything. And this is roughly what ray tracing is. Yeah? Where everyone, every time you start generating more rays, this is just a way to take an integral or an average. 
over a new set. Um, right. So, so of course, uh, one thing that we can do, and one way that people think about all these algorithms is really that they are just taking integrals. So maybe we should talk about algorithms for taking integrals. Yeah. Um, and and indeed, really, these are just integrals over different domains. Whether it's a lens or time or hemisphere or whatever. Anybody know what the name of algorithms for computing integrals? What that's called? This is like it dates back to the 1800s, actually. Like trapezoidal rule, all that kind of stuff. <coughs> Quadrature. Okay. Um, and, and there's all kinds of eye candy to show you why this is fun, right? I mean, for instance, like here you can get glossy by sending you know, different random reflection rays around the mirror direction. Um, uh, and of course, there really is, just like we talk about in machine learning, there's a bias variance trade off here depending on how many rays you send. So. so, anyway, maybe the simpler version of the same story is to just say, okay, I have x and I have f of x, and I want to compute an integral. Um, and, 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 and the question is how to do it. Right? And of course we've learned all of these, these techniques like trapezoid rule, Simpson's rule, and so on. Um, but really, um, what we've done in this class looks uh, closer to this picture, right? this Monte Carlo integration idea, where I just generate a bunch of random value uh, x's and just average or sum up their value of f of x. Right? And this is a different way of computing it to them. Right? So another way of putting it, is that the integral of a function f of x over some domain s is really just the average value scaled by the volume of s. Does this make sense? Yeah. Right. A different way of putting it, if you divided both sides by volume, right, is the integral of this divided by its volume is the average value of f in s. Right. And over here, what have I done? I've just randomly generated a bunch of points and, and taken the average value of f, so somehow these two numbers are, are related to one another. <coughs> and this is the basic idea of Monte Carlo integration. And it really is all, all just what we've done in all of our path tracing and, and so on and so forth. Yeah? So let's say uh, that I multiply, I divide the error that I'm willing to admit in my integral by 2. Does anybody know how, uh, how many more samples I would need so that my error is likely to divide by 2? So it turns out that the error of Monte Carlo integration scale, uh, 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 scales at the square root of n. So in other words, you know, like if, if I look at error, like obviously error is a random number, but you can think about it as expectation. Um, you know, if I think about error or variance, and I think about n as the number of samples, right, the, the, this thing kind of looks like 1 over the square root of n. Initially, we might say, well, that's like a pretty bad convergence rate, right? I mean, we don't like a uh, square root. But most of the techniques that we talked about, like that you might learn in calculus class, like Simpson's rule and so on, are dimension dependent, meaning that the higher the dimensional your problem is, the slower these approximations converge. And why is that a problem? What's the dimension of our integral? Well, it's awfully big. <coughs> yeah? uh, and so it turns out that square root of n is actually a savior for us, because we can do as many integrals as we want, and it still converges on the square root of the number of samples. Uh, and that's why we like uh, yeah. Um, so as, as a simpler example, uh, let's say I wanted to compute the number pi. Right? Uh, uh, of course, we know that um, pi has to do with the area of a circle or the area of a corner circle, is pi 2. Yeah. So one way I might do it is to start throwing darts at, at the square here and count the number of times it's inside and outside of the circle. And of course, the ratio of those two things is, is uh, uh, that will give me uh, this one is like pi. Pi over 4, I guess, in this case. Which is so in, in reality, I can do calculations by, by just throwing darts. Of course, by three darts, then you would get a number much more. Uh, uh, but uh, hopefully you guys get the point. These are roughly all our algorithms. We're just throwing darts in the form of rays into a seed. And, 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 and. Um, so you could ask, like, if I wanted to compute pi a different way, I could put a grid here and a grid there and count how many grid points end up inside and outside. That's perfectly fine. Yeah. Think about what happens, like let's say I wanted to compute the volume of the, like, the 50 dimensional sphere, right? Then I would need a grid that's n by n by n by n by n by n by n 50 times to do that kind of quadrature. Whereas here I could just draw, you know, some of our samples and, and have some control of the, the accuracy. Yeah? Um, and, and that's really the, the, the challenge here. So the advantage of, of Monte Carlo integration is that there are way fewer 
um, restrictions on the domain of integration. What are the disadvantages? Well, for one thing, it's noisy, right? Like we saw in all these path tracing algorithms that like you can get these random people that were white, they just happen to send a, a, a array toward the light bulb. Yeah? And we're very unlikely to know that ahead of time. And, and, and also, like, really implementing that scrambling is actually hard to see. So any questions about high-level story about money color integration? We'll talk about briefly how it's the, we can use some insight from that world to improve our rendering tool. <laughs> By the way, here's a simple sampling. This is like uniform sampling for path tracing. And here's going to be using the algorithms we'll talk about. Give us like PhD. Okay, uh, right. So, so, so let's say I want to compute one of the integrals over the sphere, right? Like I want to do the path tracing algorithm. So how would I do it right now, right? I would, I would look at this table. You know, I run the array from my eye into the table, and now with uniform probability over the whole hemisphere of possible light directions out of the table, I randomly draw a line, and I use this color to, to incorporate into my global illumination. And let's say that there's just one tiny light bulb illuminating my scene. The rest of my scene is dark. Then one way to understand what's going wrong is that really the main contributor to this integral is over a pretty small piece of that sphere. Okay? So the probability of choosing a point on that sphere that I really need to make my quadrature right um, is, is pretty low. Right? And that's why I need a lot of samples. But here's the thing. Who said that we had to use the uniform distribution on the sphere? Nobody. That's who. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and so sort of the strategy for, for making um, Path tracing and so on less noisy is to say rather than just uniformly just throwing darts at that sphere around every point, well, I know where the light bulb is and I know kind of where some of the interesting bright features are in my image. So I should use that to help me out, right? I should t try, at least try to aim my darts toward places where there's interesting stuff to be rendered. Yeah? Uh, and that's this idea of, of, of using a non uniform probability measure, where in graphics, what we say is that this is an important sample. So for instance, here, um, if I'm just doing a one-dimensional integral, if I can figure out roughly where the values are <laughs> big, right, these are the big contributors to the integral of f of x. Right? So if I make a bad approximation of f down here, it really doesn't matter. That makes sense? Cool. All right, so let's talk about glossy reflection. Right? So like that, that kind of brushed over but still middle piece of, of, of metal. A, a piece of metal that was brushed. <laughs> okay? And remember that the BRDF looks something like this. So here's the viewer, right? Uh, or I guess here's the viewer, here's the light source, right? So with, um, most of it is just this reflected angle. And now there's this kind of soft drop off around the reflection. So let's say that I go ahead, you know, I, I, I'm rendering my glossy object. And I go ahead and do, just like you've already done on your homework, the actual reflection computation. Yeah? And then what do you think will be the best way to import and sample my, my glossy um, It will be probably to put most of my random samples on this piece of the sphere. And that's exactly what these algorithms do. Right? They just bias the places where interesting things happen. Yeah? Uh, and, and this can help quite a bit. So um, here's uh, some images where you only budgeted five samples per pixel. This is extremely low number of samples. This is just to illustrate a point. And you can see that if you do it uniformly, you end up with an extremely noisy uh, here. And, and if, you, if you do it with, with more uh, uh, samples, that you, you get a, a relatively good rendering. And the reason is that all these additional areas, yeah, they do contribute a little bit to, to, to the rendering, but just not that much. OK. And in fact, uh, the effect gets even better. So with 25 samples, basically the bottom is converged, the top is still under the top. Or here's uh, the OK. If we want to repair that, uh, if we want to do important sampling, so now we have a probability of choosing each xi, and they're not uniform anymore. So if I want to take a weighted average, I have to be a little careful, right? I need to account for the fact that, that some places have lower probability than others. Um, but that's not so hard to do. This is a perfectly reasonable way of taking a weighted average. Right? Essentially what it's saying is that if I made a really high probability of choosing xi, then I should divide by that high probability when I take my weighted average, because I sort of was more likely to see that point, so I should discount it. That makes sense. So this is just a, a generalized notion of probability. And people just cook up, like, basically, <coughs> I mean, mathematically, any choice of P works, right? So you can just build up your, your favorite heuristic for the best way to import the sample. Typically, what you'll do is really look at the lobes of the P you have for most of your 
Um, and, and they're really, really nice results. So here's a, you know, a nice uh, quick sampling of them. You can see that we have a very nice soft urn. I don't know why urns show up a lot in this literature. Um, there, uh, there are many ways to kind of do this bias sampling. Um, and of course, if you go too crazy with this, you could end up in a situation like the upper right, where all of your samples now are sitting like in that low, in which case you miss the other information. So a good vocabulary word to know here, and this is actually one that you guys can implement in your ray tracers quite easily. It's something called stratified sampling. So the idea here would be, like for example, let's say I wanted to do a Monte Carlo integral to, to, to anti-alias uh, pixel in my, my ray trace image, right? So maybe what I do is I generate a bunch of random ray trace directions through that pixel kind of a nearby neighborhood of that center, right? Then, then it could be that I get unlucky and I have some kind of clumping of those random directions. This is actually an extremely likely thing to happen. And that'll manifest itself as noise by rendered image. So often what people will do instead is they'll draw a little grid over the pixel. And they'll say, OK, I'm going to generate one random number per grid set. And you guys see what happens? So in other words, you're guaranteed that every one of these squares gets some random point in it. But the individual points are still uh, perturbed from one another. And so stratified sampling is a sort of trade-off between completely random and I still want some control to make sure I see it. Right, and so a pretty typical thing to do is stratified sampling, but then like maybe add some more samples in the regions where you expect the interesting stuff. Yep. Notice this extremely high-level talk right now. These are all heuristic techniques, and you guys should go home and play with these. These are uh, not that hard to code and, 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 and kind of want to play with. And, and so it looks something like this. Incidentally, random numbers are annoying to deal with in ray tracing, just in general, because there's so many pixels. If you have a bad random number generating, you'll, you'll often actually see it in your image. Um, so sometimes people try to get rid of it altogether. Uh, one way to do that is using rook sampling. So how many of you guys remember how rooks work in chess? Let's remember rooks, if I got it right, are the ones that move up and down, left and right. And, and a rook can eat another rook if, if they're on the same row or column. Yeah? So a rook sample would be like, I place this guy here, so I make a really fine grid on, on a pixel. And now I start randomly drawing grid cells. Right? So I say like, okay, I'm gonna put a sample here. And now I'm gonna say, well that means I can't put a sample on any of these guys. Right? And that's gonna be my algorithm for the first try to find right? Yeah? Uh, so anyway, there are all kinds of uh, clever techniques, and, and they're largely kind of heuristic uh, things. And, and so there's still some, some nice analysis, at least for low dimensional domains. Notice I needed a grid to do stratified sampling, so I couldn't do this in any dimension. Okay. okay. Uh, and in high dimensions, Monte Carlo is pretty much your only choice. Uh, so if, 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 if you really like high dimensional stuff, you should transition from this class into the Bayesian machine learning classes, where they have uh, distributions of very extremely huge graphical models that they need to do inference on. And it's exactly the same problem. They have this Monte Carlo integral, they have to sample in a particular way. In their case, they have algorithms like belief propagation and so on uh, to try and, 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 and help with that, but they still have these crazy distributions to, 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 to cope with. Okay, any, uh, any questions about, about Monte Carlo and its effects on, on rendering? So there's this push-pull between, I'd like my samples to be well distributed, but I'd also like to concentrate my computational work where I think there's interesting stuff going on. All right. So for further kind of information about this stuff, there's a really nice, famous PhD dissertation you should all memorize um, that talks about like caustics and water and so on. And this is really the key textbook. It's this PBRT thing I keep mentioning. Uh, in fact, there are many books in, in, in this. In, uh, this is a very popular topic in the night. OK. Um, so anyway, uh, with that, that's all for today. So starting next week, we're going to transition from <coughs> extremely slow algorithms to fast algorithms for rendering on your GPU. We're going to talk about rasterization. Um, so finish up your problem set, and uh, I'll see you next time. <laughs>